Grassroots supporters can learn from what we had back in the 1930s under President Roosevelt. When we had a great recession, people got involved. FDR said to them, I can't do this on my own. You've got to lead. And when the people lead, the leaders will follow. And that's what Gandhi said, right? And it was true. So Roosevelt, FDR, the President Roosevelt said to the people of America, I can't do this on my own. Congress has to do it, but you have to make Congress do it. Once we do this, once we get out there as people and look at the past and see how it was done in the past, because FDR was able to bring in the New Deal to overcome the Great Depression. Now we have the Great Recession, and we're still, 99% of us are living under the, the effects of it right now. We are not out of the recession, the Great Recession for 99% of us, just the 1%. Well, my passion has to do with providing equal opportunity for everyone in this country and ultimately the world, but especially in America where the gap between rich and poor has been growing tremendously, and that cuts out the ability of people to become fully developed in their human potential. That's my passion, to give opportunity and equalize some of the results as well, because you can't have a country in which the top people are making 400 times the income of the working people, which is the bulk of the population. And how did I get into politics? I was a psychology major in college, actually. My dad was a, counselor, a psychologist and a chemical dependency counselor, and he, he was a person who was in a lot of social work. My mom was a special ed teacher, and therefore they both had a lot of compassion for other people. And that more or less, I think, came in through into my, my being and my self-concept. And I saw their lives. They, lived, they, they walked their talk. They lived their talk. And they helped people in India. My parents were immigrants from India and they worked in the villages of India to give away their services for free. And I saw how they helped other people less fortunate. And then I also asked the question, what is it that uh, causes this gap between rich and poor in the world and the United States as well? When I went to Germany as a junior in, in university, I took off the summer and traveled to Germany and Europe, I went to the Berlin Wall. When I got there, I decided I'm gonna cross the wall and go on the other side in East Germany to see what's going on, how people live there, and how this wall, this massive wall, why didn't this building could divide the same people who have the same language, the same cultural background. How could they be divided like this between East Germans and West Germans? And I went across the wall, and when I got across the wall, guess what? There were thousands on the sidewalks, thousands of people there, waiting to see Fidel Castro in a motorcade. <laughs> I was very fortunate because the people were out in the street, and I could talk to them. So I met them, I asked them how they lived, what they thought of life there. And most of them were very happy that they had the social benefits, such as free health care, free tuition, individually free, that is, and uh, all the other things they needed, the amenities for basics, but, and housing. But they did not have the freedom of, total freedom of speech or conscience. They could, of course, go to church and worship, but they couldn't speak too much about things that they wanted to. And so when I went back across, I made a lot of friends there, by the way. I went to a lot of restaurants with them and some bars and had a few drinks with them. And it was fun drinking, you know, East German uh, <laughs> drinks, and people opened up. And they told me their lives and what it was like. And when I went across back to West Berlin that evening, I started thinking, you know, what is it that brought this wall up? How did it divide these folks? And how can we reduce and bring down the walls in life for many groups? The wall between rich and poor, the wall between men and women, the wall between different ethnicities. And that's what I see Bernie Sanders doing. I see him bringing down the walls between all and the barriers that divide us as people and uniting us for a common cause, and that's to create more opportunity and equity. And that's what got me going. That's my passion. So education was free in California in 1960, all the way to the 1980s under the Master Plan for Higher Education, brought in by both parties, it was bipartisan. Governor Pat Brown, Clark Kerr, and Republicans also supported it to ensure that our young people will have a chance to get a start in life by being able to fulfill their full human potential by being able to go to college, study hard, and get a degree in four years, and go on to grad school if need be, without any debt, without any extra cost and burdens and barriers and walls to climb over. I mean, China and India are producing millions of engineers and scientists every year. And China has new technologies such as the high-speed rail nationwide, 20,000 miles of it, connecting all their cities into different technical fields and also certainly humane education dealing with philosophy and politics and critical thinking. Then we'll have citizens that are well-equipped to build the next generation of technology creating good jobs, good income for all the young people without debt, without debt, that's the key. And to me, that's the top priority is, is a universal free education system. By the way, I must mention, Governor Pete Wilson of California, former governor, went to UC Berkeley Law School and paid zero tuition for three years and became a lawyer. He paid $37 service fee, no tuition, for three years every year. 
and he became a lawyer and became a business person, a senator, and a governor. Another governor, former governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm sure many of you heard of him. Arnold Schwarzenegger went to Santa Monica College, where I taught part-time years later. Santa Monica College also was tuition-free. Arnold Schwarzenegger paid $6 service fee for all 15 units with no tuition. In two years, he was done with it. He transferred and got a bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin because he had a hand up. We need tuition-free higher education, whether it be technical school, trade school, university, or medical school. And that's what will make America great. Another issue, of course, is jobs. How do we create jobs? And that's related to education, but more than that. We have to rebuild our infrastructure. We have to have a single-payer universal health care that will cover everyone, nonprofit, Medicare for all, as our neighboring country, Canada, has and works very well over there. And all over the, uh, Europe, they have these systems of where the taxpayer funds it together, it's the government, through a progressive income tax, a medical tax, or part of the federal budget, and that money is put into the healthcare system as a nonprofit insurance company, a Medicare, which will allow you to get treated for health uh, reasons and have no deductibles, no co-payments. And that works at less cost. The Canadian system of Medicare for All is two-thirds the cost of our system, which does not have full coverage. Even with Obamacare, we have deductibles and co-payments that are breaking Americans' backs. First and foremost, we have to get those who are not voting in America to know that this is a tool. Voting is a tool. I understand why they're alienated and angry because many politicians have taken the corporate money and when the voters voted for them 20, 30 years ago, the politicians forgot the voters. They go to Washington or Sacramento in the state level and they vote the way they want for their donors, for those who bought them. And so many people in America gave up on voting and said, why should we vote? When we vote, things have gotten worse. And I understand that. But the only way to turn around is to let people know that this is a mechanism now that can be used to put the right people in office, the right people who will refuse to take corporate money, who rely on grassroots support, and get them elected. And that way, they won't, they won't be beholden to special interests and the corporate lobbyists. They'll be beholden to the American people. And you know, we have clean money elections in Maine and Arizona. In Maine, they have a system where if you're running for state assembly, all you have to do is collect $5 each from 65 people in Maine who are in your, uh, living in your district, registered voters, $5 each, that's a nominating fee. You turn the $300 over to the State Election Commission and you become a clean money candidate. In that case, you agree not to raise any private money and not even use your own private money and the state will say, uh, write you a check for several thousand dollars to reach several thousand voters in your district. That way, the Maine candidates, the ones in Maine, can focus on the campaign, on meeting voters, on greeting them, and listening to what the voters have to say, and implementing what the voters want progressively. And Maine became the first state once they passed this law in 1998. By 2000, they had implemented a uh, universal health care system that covered over 95% of their people because the legislators were 80% clean money elected. And so that's what we have to do, is show the American people that voting once again, whether their clean money system's in place or not, we can still control the candidates. It's the votes that are counted, not the donors that are counted. We know how much the donor, donors do count, but they're not the ones that are counted. The voters are counted. That's you and me. Those of us making $20,000 a year, or $50,000 a year, or even $100,000 a year, we are the ones that count, and those votes count. And so if we get out there and vote, and register and vote in the right direction, universal health care, jobs for everyone, especially high-paying jobs, education that's free of individual charge, and we have to address the issue of global warming. And that's where you have to show the American people, if we don't vote, we're going to lose everything. And the world will be affected because this is still the largest economy in the world. It's still a country that has many great ideals that the world likes to see. That's why I want to see America start walking its talk once again, because our ideals about freedom and opportunity and justice and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they are the te they're at the top. Those ideals are at the top, and the world sees when we try to pursue those ideals in empowering other people in the world, empowering our own people by giving them opportunity. And we're going to put the money instead into human development, economic development in the United States, and even throughout the world. A big component of our foreign policy has to be an economic program in which we have joint ventures to build hospitals and libraries and schools and railway lines and high technology, environmentally sustainable products throughout the world, joining with other countries. I mean, other countries have great 
technology to offer us and to share with us. And we can do it together to build a better world.